we're going to talk about two things today. Sovereignty is one of them. I don't know if you figured that out yet. But uh, sovereignty is one of them. And the other thing is, is how to deal with the judge when you're actually in court. You're, you're face-to-face with the judge. What do you do? Which do you want to hear first? The judge? All right. That's very important. Well, it's very simple. It actually is. When you go to court, at the time you go to court, you should have all your paperwork in. You say what you're going to say. You do what you're going to do. But when you're in front of the court, there is no reason to talk, okay, except for certain very key phrases. When the, you see, when you, when there's a motion before the court, or whatever reason you're there, doesn't matter, arraignment, anything else, when you're in front of the court, the court is, is not interested in what you have to contribute. The only reason you ever make any appearance in the court is so that the court can ask you questions, okay? When you file a motion, or when you file a petition, or when you file anything, you always, and I went over this in our last session, what is a motion? A motion has many different names, but when you file it, you make your, that is the actual trial, or that is the actual hearing. It's on paper. You say in your points and authorities whatever you've got to say. The other DVD of that last session goes into full detail on this. But you, that's where everything is said. When you actually get to the hearing, it's the option of the court. The court can choose not to let you say anything. And that's just fine because you've said everything already. If there's some point of confusion, the court can ask you what you intended or what you meant or something like that, and then you can explain further. Anything else is off limits. Now, you've seen attorneys get up and they put in all sorts of new evidence right at the hearing. That's not allowed unless the court chooses to allow it or unless you fail to object to it. Okay, so here's the simple rule of thumb. Anytime anything happens that you don't like, you object. That's it. Two words. I object. That's all you say to the judge. I object. You say, I object. Okay? That's all you say when anything happens that you don't like. Now, the next thing that happens, give me a moment. I got a speech here, (laughs) and I'll I'll get to those questions. Okay, the very next thing that will happen, likely, not guaranteed, is that the judge will say, well, why do you object? And your answer should always be, it is not my wish that it be that way, or that this happen. Now, you understand, this is a century's, in fact, more than centuries, it's a millennium, millennia old tradition. Kings do not issue direct orders. Okay? Why? Because the king is all powerful. Okay? So, in order to soften the, the, the uh, relationship a little, the, instead of the king issuing a direct order, the king requests or wishes for something. The king's wish is the subject's command. Okay? The judge is your subject. So when you say, it is not my wish, you are issuing, just by those words, you are issuing a sovereign verbal command. Okay? Which cannot be ignored. So when you say to the judge, it's not my wish, that's all you have to say. The sovereign is not obligated to explain himself. Okay? It is not the place of the subjects to challenge the, so- the, the sovereign. Now, the king, the, the, when, when, when you are in your sovereign capacity and you say that, the judge, if this is your very first session with the judge, 
he doesn't know this, or if he does know it, he doesn't realize this is what's happening. So he'll probably say, well, if that's the best you can do, you're overruled. Okay? And so then what you say, if you have the opportunity, if you don't have the opportunity, don't say it. But if you have the opportunity, you say, well, Your Honor, and it's okay to call him Your Honor, you know, it doesn't take anything away from your sovereignty. You just say, well, Your Honor, for the record, that is my wish. And then he says, okay, the record's noted. Okay? Noted. N-O-T-E-D. So, now, no, now, at that point, you said everything you need to say. Just move on to the next item of business. Okay? No. Yeah. Okay, okay. Order in the court. Okay. Now, the thing is, is that, that when you, when you have said that little train of phrases, you've done your job for the moment. Okay? Nothing more need be said. You've established your sovereign objection to whatever is going on. Then you move on to the next item of business. Same deal. Something else happens you don't like? I object. At some point, the judge may even say to you, yeah, I know, you object to everything. You say, thank you, Your Honor. That is true. Okay? And then you just move on. Now you don't have to say anything because... The whole process is being objected to. Okay? Now, the judge is going to do whatever he's going to do. He's going to say whatever he's going to say. You don't have the guns. He does. Okay? And, and so, you cannot, you cannot take physical control of the, of the judge. Okay? He has physical control of you whether you like it or not. Okay? So, something changed there. We got some feedback. Okay. So, what you do is you then leave the courtroom with whatever package you got. All right? Your next step is to go to your typewriter or your computer. By the way, if you're using a typewriter, I feel sorry for you. You know, word process is the only way to go. And if you, if you don't have a computer, get one. They're so cheap these days, you can get a used one for a couple hundred bucks. But what you do is you go to your, your uh, word processor and all those things that you objected to that went on, you simply issue an order reversing them. Okay? You do it on paper. Remember this. Words are into the air and they float away. They mean nothing. All that has any meaning when you're in the court is the fact that you objected and it's noted for the record. And a lot of times they don't note it on the record, so you note it yourself in your own record. You keep a notepad at the, at right there at the table, and you note when you object something, you make it. And look, they can't push you too fast. You can take all the time you need to write that note. Okay? If he asks you a question, you say, I'll be right with you, Your Honor. I've got to make a note here. Okay? So don't let them push you into keeping bad notes. You just take whatever time you need to write your note. So let me review this again, since we had a lot of interruptions on the last one. I'll just go through it again. First step is, something happens you don't like, you object. Okay, that's number one. Number two, he says, why do you object? And you say, it is not my wish. And then he says, if that's the best you can do, then... You're overruled. Okay? Then you say, well, for the record, that is my wish. And he says, okay, it's noted in the record. He may or may not say that. That is the entire procedure, okay, in the courtroom. When you leave the courtroom, that's when you issue those bombshell orders. That's when you cancel out everything he does. And I'll show you an actual example where we did this when we get into the sovereignty. All right, now, if, on the other hand, he respects your wish and says, well, 
all right, what do you want to do? Then you can say what you wish, whatever, whatever it is you do want. But whatever you do, don't argue with the judge. It gets you nowhere. Just a simple objection is good enough. Okay? He wants to shut you down. That's just fine. That's because he knows you objected to everything and so forth. Now, if, there, if the record is not being properly kept, you know, you go back and you look at the docket and you see stuff that's not on there. All you have to do is file affidavits relating to that hearing and you say, this is what really happened. And, and ideally, you should have two affidavits, two different people, okay, behind you at your hearing who saw what went on will each make up an affidavit of what they observed and when you file those in, that makes the record too. Okay? And then you issue the orders. The issues, the orders are uh, whether they're ignored or not, they build the record. At some point, the weight of the record, the conceptual weight of the record is what wins. That's all there is to a handling the judge. Okay? Yes, sir? You're in trouble. Do the best you can. Yes, sir? That's right. Everybody's your subject if you're the plaintiff. Then that brings to light Georgia. Chisholm versus Georgia says the people have no subject. Yes, sir. Well, he says Chisholm versus Georgia says the people have no subject. Well, that's true. Yes, sir. The people have no subject. Yes, sir. Chisholm versus Georgia says the people have no subject. Well, that's true. The people do not have any subjects. Okay? Hang on here. Um, the, you don't have any subjects normally, but when you do get a relationship going, you know, you're the plaintiff, the defendant is always the subject of the plaintiff. Always. That's the relationship. You know, when, and if you are the defendant, you must convert yourself into a plaintiff. Okay, the way you convert yourself into a plaintiff is you file a counterclaim or you file a habeas corpus, either way. Those are the only two methods I know for converting yourself into a plaintiff. If you filed an original lawsuit, you're obviously the plaintiff. But you file a counterclaim. The counterclaim absolutely must be based on a challenge to jurisdiction. When you challenge the jurisdiction, everything must stop in the other court until they prove their jurisdiction to your court. Okay, they have to prove it to your court. They can't just say, oh, I'm wearing a robe. That's what one, one judge told me. He says, well, my robe is my jurisdiction. Okay. But, you know, the, 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 uh, the jurisdiction is the basis of your counterclaim, and that makes you the plaintiff. And now what do you have? You have plaintiff versus plaintiff instead of plaintiff versus defendant. Now you know, and, and the, you're now the counter plaintiff and you have the counter defendant, you've converted him into, temporarily into your subject. Depending on the outcome of that case, that may or may not be the death of the other case. Okay? Uh, here. Uh, Joe had asked you when people ask questions, do you Do you want me to restate that question? Okay. Do you want me to restate that question? Yeah, please. He says, he says that when he wants me to restate the question when the question is asked or the point made. So I just did. Okay. Okay. Uh, when you file that counterclaim, you do not ask for any monetary, correct? When you file a counterclaim, you don't ask for monetary? That's not true. You add, it, it, the whole idea of a counterclaim is that you've been injured by them taking jurisdiction when they shouldn't have. And you're challenging their jurisdiction. And if you've been injured, obviously you want the, the uh, compensation for your injuries. You betcha. Okay, if it's a criminal, you still have to Is that on? Is that mic on? I don't know. If a claim, they look, we filed a, a claim, a counterclaim just recently, the in the Los Angeles court. The Los Angeles court is so large, the left hand doesn't know what the right's doing. So I went, I attempted to file it with the uh, criminal courts. They wouldn't accept it. They said, this is civil. Well, technically they should have accepted it, but they're ignorant. So 
as long as you don't, your rights are not given up, go ahead and go along with their ignorance. Okay? It doesn't hurt a thing as long as you, you're, you're retaining your rights. So what we did, we said, okay, you don't want like that? We'll go over to civil. Went over to civil. I had the proper format for counterclaim. They didn't like that. You said, well, you got to be the plaintiff. I said, okay, scratch out this part. <laughs> All right? So I scratched out the, the original criminal uh, heading, which was state versus defendant. And the lower heading was the defendant, now a counter plaintiff, versus the counter defendant. That made the court happy. Okay? And then it said on the other side, on the right side, it said counterclaim. He didn't like that. I said, okay, scratch it out. And I hand wrote complaint. Now he was happy. Now, why is it that I was able to do this? Because titles and, and, and headings do not control. What controls is what's in the body. The clerk never looked in the body. He only looked at his customary headings and he was too ignorant to know what the alternative procedures were, and I didn't want to hassle going up through the supervision and all this sort of stuff. When it, you know, I I I I have now adopted a pretty much a policy of uh, of just rolling along with them as long as the basics are not messed with. I don't worry about the details, as they say, don't don't sweat the small stuff, okay? And and so when I fi- they filed it in, and one of the uh, one of the demurs that we got back on it, by the way, the guy complained about how all this stuff was scratched out and he's confused. He doesn't know who's defendant, counter defendant, whatever. Well, it's a personal problem attorneys have. Um, okay. To follow up, though, the next oh. step, if there are damages involved, should you make the damages high enough to go to the next level court so you're not in what was a muni court? Previously? No, you should never do that. What you should do is claim the actual, actual damages, what whatever they are. What? Well, it's up to you. You you know your injury, so. Back to requiring uh, two witnesses with you. Can if you can't get the two there on that date, can Talk. you? Well, can you request from the court a uh, audio recording or a video recording of the proceeding? I don't know what their policies are, but one of the things I when uh, when when I go to court, and if I don't have two witnesses with me. Well, that's too bad. I mean, you do with the best what you can. You've got court reporters there typically. I understand that court reporters do not always properly report what was said. That happens. But they usually leave enough in so that you can hang them. So, but they, they do, uh, you do with the best you can. You know, you deal with reality. If you can't get people to back you up and be your witness, well, then that's, that's how life is. But you make your, remember this, once you're in charge, you got a lot of flexibility. Yes, sir. Bill, I had a question. Uh, the judge we're dealing with in Oklahoma will not give us an oral hearing of any kind. He doesn't have to. So in, in, in lieu of being able to say these things in court, you just put it all in writing? No, it isn't in lieu. Oh. It's what you do. I see. You always put it in writing. Okay. You, you see, if the, the judge, like, as you said, the judge won't give you an oral hearing. He doesn't have to. That's purely the discretion of the court. Okay, when you file your papers, you need to look at the DVD, which you can get from Dennis Wilson, uh, Dennis uh, Whipple. Whipple. You get it from Dennis Whipple right here, who's who's handling this. Yeah, you can talk outside. So the uh, uh, but Dennis Whipple has copies of the DVDs from before. Let him know that you want a, the other DVDs. You can get them. I don't know what he's selling them for. Now, the DVD you get for today is free. It comes with the package. But oh, if you attended last time, it's free. You should have one. But um, I went into all the details about a, a, how hearings are in, in motions. But bottom line is, is that when you make a motion, you've got to have your affidavit of facts. You have to have your points and authorities, also called a brief, which where you argue your case. And that's where that's that's the actual hearing on paper. That's your your brief is your hearing. Say what you got to say then. And, we, and the, it's purely the discretion of the court whether or not they have any questions to ask you. Once you have that hearing, you're not supposed to introduce anything unless the court asks you. Okay. So, um, in fact, if you file your papers and don't show up at the hearing, then uh, 
you still made the appearance. Now, uh, that's if you're, the, you're on the defending side. On, on, they do a demur or something like that. Yes, sir. My understanding from what I've read so far of your work is that you talk about a court of record. Well, at this point, we know nothing's on the record. There are only things in their file. No, no. You, you have a wrong conception of what a court of record no. is. Have you been to the website? Yes. Okay. I think. What is that? Somebody's phone? Okay. Anyway, time to turn off the cell phones. Anyhow, yeah, you need to go to the website and look up court of record, okay? Because um, the court of record has five requirements. Keeping a record is only one of them, okay? All right. Uh, 1215.org, 1215.org is the website. And, um, but you see, if you go to Law Notes, and uh, and then you go to the foundation, and then you have down here court of record, okay? And that gives you the five definitions, which you can copy down as I'm talking. So the thing is, is that when you're when you're in court on any kind of a hearing. That is not the time to present your case. It's too late to present your case at that point. You present your case on paper. And if the judge attempts to make any decision, you see the judge in a court of record is not allowed to make any decisions. In a court of record, if you look at requirement number two, the tribunal is independent of the magistrate. And if you look at requirement number three, it's a proceeding according to the common law. There's no statutes in a court of record. Okay? I want to point out something interesting about California Constitution. It says in the Constitution, Article 6, Section 1, all the courts in California are courts of record. Now, that's not a direct quote, but that's, that's the effect of it. All courts are courts of record. That means no statutes. It's got to be common law. That's why they have the arraignment process in a criminal proceeding. In, a, in arraignment, what they do is they, they ask you, do you accept the law but plead guilty, not guilty, or no contest? Okay? Well, if you accept the law, meaning the code, right? You're accused of violating section so and so and so and so. How do you plead? Well, if you choose any of those three pleadings, guilty, not guilty, or no contest, you've agreed to the code. You've agreed to proceeding outside the common law and inside the statutory law. You've jumped out of common law and into equity. So you need to object to the whole system. You say, you don't put any of those pleadings in. You say, I object to the whole thing. But anyway, so uh, the tribunal is independent of the magistrate. Now, when you are the plaintiff, and that's very important. Make sure you're the plaintiff. Okay, this doesn't, none of this stuff works if you're a defendant. So you absolutely must convert yourself into a plaintiff. It's easy to do. All you do is make a counterclaim. Okay? And the challenge is the jurisdiction. You can have other challenges. You can have other claims for injuries. You know, you got beat up in jail. Something. You know, that, those are, those are claims you can make too. But the primary claim that you make is that the uh, uh, the primary claim is that they exceeded their jurisdiction. Now, this is an important point. You all know about the Bill of Rights. You all know about how supposedly you have rights. The truth is, you have no rights. Okay. You have a constitution. The purpose of the constitution is to keep the government surrounded with an invisible fence. So, you do not plead, your pleadings are, when you're going against the government, your pleading is not that, that they violated your rights. Because there's nothing in there in the Constitution that says they can't violate your rights. Okay? So, it's a, it's a, it's a wrong kind of claim. What you do is you claim that they exceeded their jurisdiction. 
the, 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 if they don't have jurisdiction granted to them by the Constitution, then they can't take it. And so, if they do take jurisdiction over you when they shouldn't, then you challenge that. You say, you guys exceeded your jurisdiction. And because you exceeded your jurisdiction, you caused an injury. And because you caused an injury, you owe compensation called damages. That's, that's the sequence. Now you have, uh, you have a logical string of, of points here to make. So, remember that. They exceeded the jurisdiction, number one. Number two, that resulted in an injury. Number three, they owe you damages for those injuries. If, they, if you lost any of your rights, that's the injury. You lost your liberty, your liberty. That in itself is an injury, just the loss of your rights. They took your property. One of your rights, natural rights, not civil rights, Civil rights are privileges granted by the government. Natural rights you're born with. So, if you lost a natural right, the right to speech, free speech, the right to free locomotion, the Bill of Rights lists them, okay? Among, but you have more. You, if you lose any of those things, then what you do is you claim an injury. That is the injury itself, okay? You don't have to spill blood. Just the mere fact that you did not have the, uh, were not able to exercise the right of voluntary locomotion. In other words, you can't walk anywhere you choose to walk. Okay. The only limitation is, is that you cannot impose on the rights of someone else. Okay. So, um, bottom line is that you've got to be the plaintiff and then you can make these claims and you super, your court supersedes their court on that basis. So, are there any questions on that? Okay. Bill, if you're already in a court situation now, can you, can you become the, the, the plaintiff through habeas corpus or by counterclaim if you're well, already in the case? Yeah, if you're already in court, you've already got a hot case going, and you've gone down the line, there are some practical limitations to the uh, um, to this to making a counterclaim, yeah, you should make a counterclaim before they've really had uh, a chance to move down the, the line on it. I'd make a counterclaim the minute I know there's charges. Okay, but if you're if you're downstream, um, the counterclaim becomes a little dubious. So you can always do a claim later anyway. But what you can always do is habeas corpus. Now, if you do a habeas corpus by motion, where you go into their court and you make a motion to them and you're begging the judge to do the right thing, 99.999% of all of those habeas corpuses get denied. Okay? But if you do a common law habeas corpus, uh, a constitutionally based habeas corpus, which is the same thing, you do a habeas corpus, you are in your sovereign capacity. By what authority do they presume to rebel against the sovereignty of the country or the sovereignty of the state? Okay? If you are one of the people of, a, uh, uh, of the state or one of the people of the country, of the United States in other words, well then, they have no authority over you. The only way they can get authority over you, well, first of all, they can't. There's no way they can get authority over you, okay? Just like the robber has no legal basis for taking your money. He may still do it, but he doesn't have a legal basis. So there is no legal basis, no way that they can take over you if you are sovereign. But what they can do is they can carry their information they have against you over to a grand jury. And then the grand jury produces an indictment. When an indictment is pr produced, that takes it out of the hands of the government. It is now into the hands of the people. That's the theory. Then the next step is a petite jury, or in other words, a jury of 12. And then the, the government can present its case, but it's still in the hands of the people. Okay, the jury this time. That's the theory. 
Unfortunately, we no longer have people sitting on the jury. What we have is citizens of the United States sitting on the jury. And as you may recall, I've made a distinguishment between, I do distinguish between people and citizens. The people own the government and the government owns the, the citizens. And uh, that is, um, that's clarified here in uh, people or citizen, which one are you? Okay, when you go back to that page. Okay, so if, if you, this all explains how the preamble works. Okay, so let me ask you this. Is everybody clear on what to do?